Welcome back to As It Happens. Tonight, I want to talk about the big issue what, of what seems to be an institutionalized corruption, which leads to a lack of service delivery and its link to our faltering economy. My special guest is Chepo Khadima, a political analyst and an economist to hear why for years the country's leaders have played the proverbial fiddle whilst the country was and still is going up in flames. Welcome, Tsepo, to this special edition of As It Happens. Remember also that you can call me live in studio on 011-759-6340. You can also tweet me uh, at Bantu Olomisa or say to, or also tweet me on a a e -N -C -A. We're now going to the question time. Good evening, Chepo, and welcome to this special ed edition. Thank you, General. It's good to be here, and uh, good evening to all the viewers of uh, ENCA across the country, and in the continent, I believe. Yes. From gear to the NDP, our economy seems to be faltering and hasn't taken off to the point of empowering South Africans. Where do you think the radical economic transformation process needs to start from? Well, I think the the key, the tonic that we need to be able to get the economy where it can be able to create jobs, where it can grow sustainably, that tonic is the changing or rather the moving away from the already discredited macroeconomic policy tool which is sometimes referred to as neoliberalism. And simply put it means that the state effectively doesn't have to intervene in the economy and uh, it is hoped by the legislators and the policy makers that the private sector out of benevolence will do what is right and what is right in terms of what of ensuring that the tax revenue they they will pay enough tax revenues into the state coffers in order for the state to be able to carry out all the uh, social needs of the population whereas uh, then they will take care of creating jobs as it is often said that the government cannot create jobs. But that is far from the truth. I think neoliberalism or less intervention by the state, we already have enough ample evidence that it cannot work. The two uh, policies that you are referring to, gear and even talking about NDP now, if you look at it, all of them, they are based on neoliberalism, meaning that we are hoping that the private sector will be able to create the jobs that we but, need, but that they will be able also to right. pay the taxes that can get the government to carry but out how do you, But how do you achieve, plan to achieve that, given that there are tensions at NetLeg? The business suspects uh, Labour to be in, 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 in the same bed with the ruling party. Equally so, the Labour at times feels that the government is selling out. So how do you plan, therefore, to talk about uh, transforming that uh, body, whereas they have not agreed or they have failed to identify what kind of macroeconomic policy should inform South Africa's economy? Look, the macroeconomic policy that this country really needs to embrace or rather embark on. I think it is a macroeconomic policy, particularly on two levels. That of ensuring that uh, we, ha we can be able to take back the functions of the central bank. One of the key problems we sit with as a nation now is the high levels of debt. In 1994, when the first budget was delivered, which was on the 21st of June, 1994, this country's indebtedness 
was effectively the debt to GDP ratio and also the debt to the taxes that we were collecting. 31 cents was going towards paying debt of the taxes that were collected. Today, the situation is getting back to those days of 1994, where almost 20 cents, or just over 20 cents, is going towards paying the debt that we have. So we have to do away with the debt. And the debt that we have today is a result of the macroeconomic policy which we embraced, which means but in, this, the but, in the same, but, but in the same vein, one pers people, a certain per a group of people in this country are going to say that debt is, has also been accumulated by high levels of corruption. Today we are talking about a need to, do, to conduct a commission of inquiry on state capture. One wonders whether such a state capture will ever take off given that the main culprits or suspects were identified by the public protector mm. are out of the country and there are no prospects of them coming back to testify in such an inquiry. How are we going to handle this? Well, I think the big report for, for me is really a starting point. The big report for the African Union says that over 64 percent of corruption that we're seeing, it is private sector led. It's for that reason we speak of over 100 billion rent a year that leaves this country illicitly. So yes, you must tackle all manners of corruption, but by tackling corruption, my starting point would be ensuring that we've got the law enforcement agencies that are equipped, that are knowledgeable about really, that, that can be able to have the capacity to not only investigate, but bring before a open competent court a case that can be competent of prosecution. The problem we sit with right now is that we hear a lot of memories about corruption, but the law enforcement agencies, for whatever reason, seem to be constrained from from being able to bring before an open court it, a competent, a competently uh, it, persecutable case. And it, that is the nub of our problems. Is it not because some of these appointees at government level, especially on security cluster mm -hmm. and even on economic cluster, uh, are the deployees from the ruling party? Sometimes some of them don't have a clue of what they are doing. Take, for instance, the, 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 the restructuring of the corporate mm. uh, SOEs. I doubt very much if those names which have been removed or replaced by others, the new guys have been, uh, they, they have been presented to the cabinet. It looks like it's just a purging, people are appointing their own friends. How are we going to develop this country and making sure that we follow a plan as was approved by South Africans? Well, that should worry us more. But I think, General, my, my approach is this. And I think you effectively, yourself, as the leader of the United Democratic uh, Movement, you've set the tone that sometimes we believe that the government, and particularly a government that is a governing uh, by the majority, should be able to be the solution to all our problems. And invariably, many times it is not. But what am I saying? By effectively using our constitution then to ask the courts to be the arbiter for me seems to be the solution of saying in those instances where we know that the appointments that have been made are not proper and also ensuring that the people can be truly held accountable you find that in parliament you are suffering from the tyranny of the majority whereby whatever you raise as an issue it is not seriously a debated and action taken. So those are the things that I think that the continuum of using the courts, I can't see that coming to an end. But if anything, what we have learned effectively is that to develop jurisprudence, to ensure that our constitution is sacrosanct and it's solid, is by ensuring that we can ask the courts to do what? To give us clarity, uh, uh, ensure that there is consistent application to the law. And in many instances, you are referring to, for example, recently the changes that have been made with the many state-owned company, uh, companies' boards that have been changed. Those changes have been cosmetic, but if anything for me, it is just another uh, form of capture because if you look at their ability to perform, and I always recommend that people need to read the book uh, by Professor Michael Watkins from Harvard University, The First 90 Days. You find that 90 days lapses and a board of directors of a company still cannot come up with a turnaround strategy that makes sense. And I think yesterday Simple the working out was this. Simple yeah. question before we proceed to yes. other areas. Do you think this commission of inquiry will produce effective findings 
if the Gupta families are not brought back into the country to testify? Don't you think that is just a waste of time? And given that these Guptas, the monies which they are alleged to have taken out, they were working with the government, government ministers. It is the ministers who are giving them permission. It was the ministers who were giving authority for ESCOM and other SOEs to buy airspace or airtime to SA, SAPC. But that money was not going to the SAPC. It was going to the Guptas. So this institutionalized corruption just put us at rest. How can we tackle it? I see no reason whatsoever why any of the witnesses that must testify before the commission will not be able to do so, including those that are not in the country. And I see no reason why our law enforcement agencies will be constrained legally Howsoever, in terms of the international protocols we have to ensure that everybody who must testify must testify. But it must not be scratching on the surface. We need to ensure that we go deep in to get rid of the rot that is uh, facing our country. But everything must be done in parallel. In terms of macroeconomic policy shift and overhaul, that we must do whilst at the same time ensuring that our law enforcement agencies are properly capacitated to ensure that we don't just speak about corruption, but we are dealing with corruption because positive platitudes from the uh, pl uh, Rostrum General are not enough. Action is what matters and we, what we want to see now is our government being able to act, not pursuing a political... Uh... All right. That was my special guest, Sepo Khadima, a political and economic analyst. I'll be back shortly when we take your calls.